about it, that uh, Hellenistic perspective, in order to communicate better, in order to engage better with the audience. However, uh, regardless of that gap, there's such a commonality, such a, an overarching theme, uh, common understanding of the spiritual and physical realm throughout the Bible. And even sometimes the verbiage, you know, uh, are, are are similar to each other. And um, when you carefully study in the Bible, then you can do you can understand that there is a mastermind behind uh, this book called Bible. There's a mastermind. Although it took human hands to write these down, there was such a mastermind that conducted everything that coordinated everything. They inspired each person with the same worldview, with the same understand, understanding, with the same purpose. The uh, When we read books, we oftentimes pay attention to, we, we need to, we're, we're taught to pay attention to the um, intention of the author, right? The author's intention is very important. Otherwise, we will not understand what the book is trying to say. I know that this is very um, different from, uh, you know, uh, post-modern uh, modern understanding, uh, because postmodernism is that um, even regardless of the under, uh, intention of the author, like I understand it from however I want to understand. I, well, that's one way to look at it, but uh, we also don't want to miss the fact that the author wrote this with an intention. You know, when we look at an artwork, of course, the artwork is very, um, it, it's an art. <laughs> we cannot really analyze, like, uh, scientifically, or just like when we look at a machine, we cannot do that. However, still, there's an intention behind that artwork. Um, that person had that perspective, right? And. That should be taken into consideration in order to appreciate artwork, right? And that's part of the reason when we um, study art, <laughs> although it's art, we um, not only talk about the colors, the shapes, you know, how beautiful it is, but we want to understand what kind of background there was. You know, the the artist was um, born and grew up in such an environment, in such such a province, such a country, uh, under su such culture. Uh, this person had um, interactions with a certain group of people or with his own teacher or with, um, he was surrounded by the people who were different than him or like he, was, he grew up in a farming society, things like that. That actually shows up in your artwork. It's reflected. And also, not only that, uh, this person was having such a, like a, you know, oh, this person was at the end of his life, you know, having gone through so much and, you know, at the end, he understood this, like, oh, new, new understanding, new insight. And that's why he um, created this artwork. Or, uh, you know what, he was really young in his uh, career, but he has such a memorable, significant encounter with a certain group of people and he came to realize this and that's why he created this artwork you know so we want to know the background because uh, we want to know the uh, author or the artist whoever made this the creator's uh, perspective and just like that when we read the bible of course we want to understand it from our own perspective too but what was the intention behind this? What is the purpose? Where is it coming from? I say he because um, the Bible was written by, inspired by God, and he's referred to as he, not because we are, um, not because we are uh, sexist or we have uh, gender biases, not, not because of that. God, in fact, has both male and female aspects to himself. He describes himself 
um, as father, which is male, right? He also describes himself as a mother hen that's trying to gather her chicks. Um, the name uh, Elohim means he is almighty versus El Shaddai, it means double-breasted one, like a, a feeding mom. So he has both male and female aspects, but nevertheless we call him he. So I want you to understand that. So um, his perspective, his purpose, his um, understanding of the view, his wisdom is all hidden behind all these books written by different authors. So um, let's see if Divina is a way to, the primary purpose of doing that is to encounter God, to meet God who is, uh, who is a spirit. Yes, he did walk on this earth um, in the form of a human being. However, um, he is not just that. The incarnate God is one aspect of himself and there is greater aspect, greater um, aspect that, that we cannot even fathom. So then how do we get to know him? Because the reason he created each human being is to be in love relationship with him. I know it sounds really strange. What? You're in a love relationship with God? <laughs> Are you out of your mind? Um, I know it sounds strange. When I say love, I'm not talking about the the uh, romantic kind of love between a man and a woman, um, especially the physical aspect of it. I'm not talking about that. But that is kind of symbolic of how God wants to engage with us. Uh, because to our limited understanding and to our limited experiences, it makes better sense if we talk about a couple, you know, if we talk about a marriage relationship. That is the, the closest relationship that we can ever imagine. Or uh, mom and a child, you know, dad and a child. So that would be the closest uh, and the most significant relationship that we can ever imagine, right? And that's why God describes himself as Father God. He also described himself as the husband. Um, but we're talking about that kind of intimacy, that kind of um, interdependence. We're talking about that kind of interaction, that kind of transparency. Um, and, and because our marriage system and our family system is so bro broken, we sometimes have difficulty understanding what it means. Um, the, the healthiest form of marriage, the healthiest form of family, happiest form of marriage, the happiest form of family that we can ever observe or imagine, God wants that kind of relationship with us. And that's why he created us. Um, then uh, the, the greatest thing that we can do, what is the greatest thing that you can do for your parents? Uh, this is also uh, because we are so fallen. <laughs> Sometimes we have difficulty like Okay, if I can only uh, become a lawyer or a doctor, my parents will be so happy and they'll love me more. I don't know. Uh, if I become the president of the United, United States, <laughs> president of the United States, or uh, of course, this is not by your choice. If I were uh, a prince in Britain, <laughs> probably my parents will be very happy and they'll love me. Um, I'm not sure if we think in that term, and certainly, certainly because our parents have great expectations of us, um, uh, we we may sometimes feel that pressure. But uh, what is the best thing that we you can do as family? Love. Uh, time after time, I'm hearing about so many millionaires um, who have made their names known by their wealth um, in their deathbed because in order to build that wealth, they had to sacrifice their family. Not that they had to, but they decided to. Um, there's a difference. Um, then what happened? In the end, in their deathbed, they say, if I can only get back my wife and my children, I will sacrifice 
like even to the penny, all my wealth in exchange for that. They lived a very diligent life. They probably worked day and night. Uh, not only to just earn money, but to, um, to manage it. But in the end, what they say is, I regret my life is wasted because I lost my wife, I lost my children. Meaning uh, the children, uh, they were so hurt by father's absence. And I, you know, I, I'm talking about like stereotypical, you know, case because there are so many uh, uh, women business people too, female business uh, people now, uh, but all your life you you made effort you know to build wealth and, and even even perhaps you for your children <laughs> for the benefit of society maybe not just for yourself but when you sacrifice your family in the end um, they're so hurt they don't even want to come and see you when you die that's the greatest tragedy you can experience so when they look back and they say oh i regret my life Practically, I regret my life. You remember uh, King Alexander, you know, who um, had a great empire. And every uh, history in every country talks about him, right? Because he was such a um, phenomenal impact in the human history. But do you know what he said? Um, when I die, please put two holes you know, on the side of my coffin and put my hands outside so that people will know the great Alexander, Alexander the Great actually died with empty hands. He couldn't take anything with him. It should be this lesson for all humanity. That's what I want to leave behind. What can you take with you when you die? And if you don't believe in afterlife, then you know I have nothing to say. But there is a life that begins, the, the real life that begins after our physical, biological death. And how many times people pay attention and they make effort to, they, they have retirement plans. And I'm not against retirement plans, please do. But how much do you care about your eternal life, the life that is real and that will last for eternity. And of course, I'm speaking to myself as well because I oftentimes get carried away by the business of life, that busy life. Um, well, what am I busy for? I'm not saying that you should drop all your jobs. I'm not saying that drop everything and love your family, no. But um, if we know the priorities, we will, our lives will be different. And that's such a challenge because um, sometimes it takes like a dramatic decision. Sometimes it takes a major sacrifice in order to make that time, to make yourself available for your loved ones. But that'll be the greatest investment that you can make. And ultimately we will be with God forever. Do you know that? Where with our family are our loved ones? And I'm not saying that our loved ones are so nice and, you know, like, um, lovey-dovey. I'm not saying that. I understand that families have dysfunctions and we sometimes have times when we want to get away from them. I understand that. But still, deep down into our, our, our hearts, right? In our hearts. Um, we cannot reject them. We cannot abandon them, right? Um, We're going to spend eternity either with God or in absence of God in, 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 in full of evil. Are we ready for that? Um, are we living for that? What kinds of decisions do we need to make daily, moment to moment, um, in order to pursue something that is the, actually the most important thing? 
plenty of lessons are out there because people have passed away before us. Then what kind of lessons are we taking? So I know I, I went a little long with this, but uh, back to Alexio Divina, and I'm not saying that doing the Alexio Divina is going to save you. No, I'm not saying that. But God is somebody that we're going to spend eternity with or without. He is the beginning and the end. He's the Alpha and Omega. He is the cause of our birth, and he's the cause of our death. I'm not saying that, well, there, there is evil, you know, like uh, school shooting and things like that. Well, that was not God's will. But you know what? Our life is in the hands of God. Um, he's the one who created us with a purpose, and he's the, the one who is going to actually meet with us and say, oh, you lived a life according to my purpose. Oh, you know what? Um, your, your whole life, I, I tried to reach out to you, but you never responded. I, t I totally uh, inspired you every time that you are supposed to have a relationship with me, that you need to uh, really change the direction of your life. You did not listen to me. I gave you tons of chances. You don't have any more chance. Now it's final. And your destination is the place where I am not. He, he's the judge. And I know that this is a very unpopular idea. Who are you to say this agenda? You know, like you're trying to push your agenda. That's what you believe in. I don't believe in that. I understand that. But you know what? In the end, if you actually meet God, uh, Postmodernist arguments don't work. Any argument, no, no argument works. Because there's a, the, the absolute reality that we, we don't have control over at that time. We have some control over now. We have control over our lives, well, with limitations. Uh, we have control over certain choices that we make. And that choice has eternal consequences. And yes, it's up to you. Uh, you can totally reject or accept. I leave it up to you. I'm not forcing anybody. I'm not twisting arms. But I'm just letting out that, that, that this is something very significant for each of you. That in the end, there's a judge. God is the judge. The greatest human being to the lowest human being, whatever the categorization that you use, are going to stand before God and report to him what he or she has done according to God, has not done according to God, God's will, and will be judged accordingly. And do we even realize that? Or are we making those choices in our moment-to-moment moment -moment life? What's going to be helpful? What's going to be helpful in terms of, of understanding God's will? living according to God's will, what's going to be helpful so that I will not lose sight of the priorities? Oh, I'm going to stop and spend time with God. And let's see your divina is one of the ways, one of the ways. Spending time with God is therefore important. I'm not saying, oh, you know, I have this religious background and I'm trying to push this agenda and therefore do the Alexia Divina. No, I'm not saying that. For your own benefits, because however you live your life actually does not affect me. <laughs> Let me tell you, honestly. But I'm saying this for your own benefit, that um, we need to stop and spend time with God in order to straighten uh, our, our crooked paths, in order to live a life that in the end does not regret, like in the end, like this millionaire, well, trillionaire. <laughs> I regret my entire life if I could only get back my family. I don't care if I live poorly for the rest of my life. You know, like I, I, I totally wish for that. Um, 
So let's say Odugina is in that sense helpful. It's one of the ways to engage with God. And um, I'm going to talk about Fiji Odugina uh, briefly. This is another way of doing this. Uh, Physio Divina follows the pattern of Lexio Divina using sacred art. So Lexio Divina is utilizing the Word of God, which is the Bible, primarily focusing on the Bible. And through that Bible, you can use your all, also your spiritual five senses doing that. But this is utilizing the sacred artwork. Uh, it could be a religious painting. It could be... Um, something that reminds you of God. Um, it fosters the practice of sacred seeing, divine seeing. It has been used throughout the centuries, more popular in Catholic and Eastern Orthodox communities where icons are often used in prayer. So it has become kind of controversial. Some people treat this artwork like an idol. But if you uh, look carefully through uh, these different sects, uh, especially Eastern Orthodox communities, you can see uh, that they're not necessarily idolizing that, those sacred art. Uh, some people, there are always people who misunderstand, right? Even if you have the correct teaching, there are people who misunderstand and they tend to go astray <laughs> and they do things that have not been taught. But um, they oftentimes don't utilize icons as idols, but as a reminder so that they can draw closer to God. So that should be the way to utilize these uh, sacred art. So simply five steps okay, of Physio Divina process is choose an image. You have a choice, right? However you feel inspired. So I actually provided some uh, examples that you can use. Um, you can actually visit like online uh, museums, online museums, or museums that have websites that provide certain um, uh, masterpieces. So you can actually, uh, you know, uh, click on it and then you can actually take a look at it. So it could be on your screen too. If you have the artwork in your home, that's wonderful. Um, if you can go somewhere like uh, a church or a cathedral where you can actually see the artwork, that's wonderful. So however you want to get the, the image, uh, utilize that image, then you can actually do that. And so choose an artwork, pray, and be still. Why do we pray? Um, because uh, in this day and age, we tend to be too busy. And our, our minds and hearts tend to be occupied by certain concerns or our daily issues. So then uh, we need to really focus. In order to focus on God, we need to really pray and ask for help and really uh, make effort in order to be still. It's the best if you uh, try to fill your minds with, with God, uh, God's presence, just sense his presence and welcome him in, then all, all other thoughts actually subside. Gaze at the image, focus on the characters and objects, Note your, note your feelings. Read or listen to accounts of the events, scripture, insights into artwork, guided meditation, etc. So, see, um, the background is important, right? Um, account of the events, like what kind of situation, biblical um, event that is it describing? Um, and then the artwork, okay, this. So, there's a little bit of study that, that can be done beforehand. I don't recommend that you do study during Visio Divina. No, Visio Divina. It should, it should take place before any study. Um, who was this artist and uh, why did he come up with this artwork? Uh, what kind of perspective does he have? Again, that would be helpful, right? Guided meditation. So somebody, somebody in front of you, maybe it's a group process, or it's not a group process, but you know, a group of people are doing the same thing. Uh, with this uh, person who is guiding. Gaze at the artwork again. Imagine that you're in the scene. What do you see from your point? What do you hear? Use all five senses to explore. We're talking about the five spiritual senses, right? How does this exercise relate to your life now? What insight from this experience do you want to retain? How will you do that? 
That's one way to look at it. Okay. Um, another way to look at it is uh, at the bottom, right? Pray through the image. Open your eyes while looking upon the image, respond to God. So the first process that I just talked about is um, focusing a little more from individualistic perspective, like what do you want to take? But it's important to surrender to God, respond to God. So pray through the words, images, emotions, questions, and thoughts. Continue to look up at the image as you pray close and rest your eyes briefly. Rest and reflect in God. As you close out your time in prayer, open your eyes and gaze again upon the image. So, choose an image and pray for before you actually engage in Physio Divina or as part of the beginning of Physio Divina. Just pray. Try to be still um, by welcoming God and ask God, what do you want to reveal to me? Like, I'm not trying on my own, but Lord, please uh, open my spiritual eyes so that you, uh, so that I will be able to see the things that you want me to see. And then you open your eyes, look at the image, gaze at it, just ponder. Oh, what kind of event is it describing? It'll be hard if, if it's an abstract art, right? But if it's depicting an event, what kind of event? What kind of people to event? Oh, I'm in the scene. I'm one of the characters. Or if, if it's just one person, then, oh, you know, that's me. Or um, you can also assume God's perspective too, like, I want, to, I want to know how God feels about this. And then um, ask God again, God, what do you want me to focus on? Okay, I understand the general context and general message of the artwork, but Lord, do, what do you want to take with me? What do you want to reveal to me? What, what, what do you want me to focus on? Or the sun? Oh, the sun. Oh, oh the, just the flowers in front. Oh, that uh, person's clothes. Oh, you want me to focus on that. So then, uh, once you actually feel that the Lord is uh, guiding you to focus on certain things, then you focus on that. Oh, why do you want me to focus on this? Why is always important, right? Then uh, ask God, uh, what is the message that you're giving, giving me? What do you want me to understand? And then it's helpful if you journal it, you know, how you felt. And then uh, you close your eyes, pray again, uh, just reflecting on God's message for you through the, the image, and uh, just give thanks and say, oh, uh, thank you for the message that you're giving me. I enter into your presence, uh, just resting. I rest in your presence. And then you close that time. Even if it's the same artwork, just like the scriptures, you may have a different message for that day. You may have a different understanding about God for that day. So that's about um, Physio Divina. And there are schools of spiritual formation, Desert Fathers, um, and uh, many other uh, people who have contributed to spiritual discipline. So, um, for the Desert Fathers, uh, during the late 3rd century, a Christian man named Paul, living in the city of Thebes, Egypt, was forced into the desert during the persecution of Emperor Theseus. Paul, Thebes, uh, Paul of Thebes lived in a cave and was waiting for the persecution to end. And he enjoyed the solitude and freedom to fast and pray as a hermit. And a man in Egypt named, named Anthony was also inspired, inspired by the gospel to give up his positions and serve God alone. And while in worship, 
Anthony heard God speaking to him, if you would be perfect, go and sell what you have and give to the poor and come, follow me, and you shall have treasure in heaven. Anthony immediately left all his possessions and started to live a life in the desert. So he's known as the father of desert monasticism. So we see uh, Paul of Phyllis and um, also Anthony. Um, the hermit. Around this time, Anthony heard about Paul, the hermit, and went to visit him in the seclusion of the mountains. So Anthony and Paul have an, um, have a, an encounter. Anthony was inspired by his way of life and was convinced that God was also calling him to become a hermit in the wilderness. So um, they both became hermits and um, desert monasticism is developing as a result. Right? Anthony's life and wisdom inspired numerous men and women to give up their worldly ambitions and live in solitude, worshiping God. So this is not um, for everyone, but only for very special people who, who God calls, whom God calls to live. Uh, it could be the entire life, but it could be also period of life where you are called to live as a hermit. Anthony's life and wisdom inspired numerous men and women to give up and so follow their way of life, right? Monasteries developed and um, spread throughout Egypt over time as a result. A rule of life was formed. What is the rule of life? So throughout your whole day, what are you going to do, right? Um, of, course, of course, you might have to work to some degree, um, even in the wilderness, in order to um, gather your uh, your food or to uh, teach people how are you gonna uh, how are you gonna teach people they might need to um, you know have a papyrus or you know something to to write on right um, but we're gonna get your clothes you might have to work a little bit but then uh, most of the time you are spending time with God right um, and I'm not saying that in your daily life, uh, through your daily routine, you don't spend time with God. No, um, it should be all throughout. Like even when we're eating, even when we're cleaning, even when we're taking care of our children, um, engage with God. However, these people specifically retreated into the wilderness and just actively spend time with God. Um, certainly it's like dropping off the normal life, right? Dropping off the routines. So a rule of life was formed and other holy men and women gathered to take up the call to the desert. So then other, other people, who are these people? Uh, Saint Pacomius, uh, Saint um, Haman, Saint Basil of Caesarea, Saint um, Curius of uh, Egypt, Saint Moses the Black. Those who were highly influenced by this early monasticism were Saint uh, Athanasius of Alexandria, St. John Chrysostom, St. Hilarion, and St. John Cassian. And St. Benedict uh, later developed his own rule of monasticism. So this is Benedictian monasticism, based on the writings of these early desert fathers. And um, St. John Cassian brought the wisdom of the desert fathers to Europe. And at that time, his influence uh, reached as far as Ireland. So what started in Egypt, so it, it'll be very interesting to study, uh, you know, uh, the Egyptian tradition, right? And then it spreads out to Europe now. Much of the zeal of early Christian monastics um, may have been anticipated by the Jewish Krumnan community, made famous in the 20th century by the discovery of Dead Sea Scrolls. Qumran community is by the Dead Sea, around the Dead Sea area. They lived together and they uh, copied manuscripts of the Bible and they studied the Bible, meditated, shared their teaching. They lived together to live a life of a follower of God. The community usually identified with the Essenes is a religious group group that flourished in the Judea desert between 150 BC and 70 AD. 
and he became the main influencer of, uh, influencer of Jewish monasticism. The Qumran ascetics, ascetics means uh, they withdraw themselves from all the worldly desires, um, even eating uh, pleasures, um, and uh, just withdrawing uh, from, like cutting down and withdrawing from, from all the desires, uh, human desires. They consider themselves to be the true Unpolluted carriers of Orthodox Judaism and denounced the Jerusalem priesthood, which they characterized as defiled, spurious, and unclean, solid by Hellenism, and potentially heretical, contrary to Orthodoxy. And so, um, it might be uh, largely true. Jerusalem priesthood uh, was probably very corrupted. But even among that, um, God has remnants, certain people who have not corrupted themselves uh, with the world uh, or uh, the evil forces of the world uh, with secular desires, with um, worldly ways of living. There are always remnants, I believe that. Um, so rigorous asceticism, communal prayer, Common work were the rule. Through celibacy may not as yet have been expected of members of the community. Though celibacy was not you know, may not as yet have been expected. So um, they were living a very ascetic life, communal prayer, common work, um, just repenting and cutting cutting out of their sin. Um, but they were not expected to uh, live as celibate life. And monastic institutions may have aided the progress of civilization too. Um, in monasteries, they came up with different um, inventions because they had to they uh, maintain their daily lives um, without the outside help. So they there were many inventions. Um, they were an instrument for the creation, preservation, preservation, and transmission of secular and religious traditions. Because they lived as a uh, community, or contributed to the civilization and also religious traditions. Monasteries served as a center for raising religious leadership. So they trained next, uh, next generation leaders. Isn't it amazing that you can do this in the desert? <laughs> a clear dichotomy, like, dichotomy between training secular clergy, bishops and priests in the Jerusalem, I guess, and training regular clergy abbots and uh, brothers. So when they say secular clergy, you're being trained to be sent out into the centers of the world, into, into a society. And then you have regular clergy who were supposed to remain in the wilderness. Most Christian monastics, both men and women, continue to be lay persons. So that they called each other brothers and sisters. But actually, when you say brothers and sisters, that, that is the highest form of on honor. Do you know why? Because you're not just brothers and sisters. You're Christ's, Christ's brothers and sisters. We're placed in, in an equal position as uh, Jesus, God. Uh, that is only possible because Jesus died and washed away our sins so that we can become God's children. Jesus as the big brother, and we are his brothers and sisters. That's the greatest honor that we can ever experience. So uh, these brothers and sisters um, took vows, but were not ordained. At least into the 20th century, the monk or nun was usually thought to be more uh, radical and less compromising than the ecclesiastic or church functionary. So. The churches out there in the society versus the churches in the wilderness. This was considered as more like much less polluted, uh, polluted um, pure, holy, and radical. So Basil, we, we talked about Basil. Basil's role for Eastern monasticism. Uh, Saint Benedict was the early Western monasticism. So Benedict of Nursia, 480 to 547. 80, a practical Roman whose role 
which was uh, based on an earlier monastic rule known as the rule of the master, is often recognized for its humanity and moderation. So his regular, uh, which enjoyed poverty, enjoined poverty, chastity, obedience, and stability, was followed until the 13th century by diverse orders, including Knights Templars and most other paramilitary aristocratic orders, and it remains the rule of the Benedictine, uh, Benedictine order today. Benedictine order today. It's a noble for uh, it's a it's it is notable for uh, providing an effective model of monastic government and for its requirement adopted by all subsequent Roman Catholic monastic orders that the individual monk not not own property. So once again, poverty, chastity, obedience, and stability were valued. They, they, these were the um, key um, goals that they always pursued. Um, and uh, some scholars believe that the uh, uh, Jain rule um, provided the model for all monastic rules in India and thus uh, indirectly for the monastic traditions in all Asian countries that came under India's religious tutelage. The SNS, regardless of whether they were identical with the Cormoran settlement, provided, provi probably had a written rule. They were highly formalistic, emphasizing ritualistic purity with um, ablutions prescribed for the members, and they maintained a rigorous adherence to the letter of the Jewish ritualistic and legal books, Leviticus and Deuteronomy. The Teutonic Order, it was a German uh, uh, Deutscher Ritual Orden is the, the German name for that. Uh, found in, founded in Jerusalem in 1889-90, enjoyed an independent relationship with Rome and with papal administrative bureaucracy. Yeah, this arrangement was especially defined, specifically defined by more than 100 papal bulls. The uh, Grand Master, who enjoyed the same rights as the Prince of the Holy Roman Empire, was assisted by five um, Grand Commanders. So this organization was composed of knights, the noblemen, um, priests, and servant brothers, and was established to do hospital service, later focusing more on military service. After the fall of Acre, the order moved its headquarters to various places in Europe, and the order revived its military function starting in the uh, early 13th century when European rulers, including the Roman, Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II, authorized it to do battle against the Altaic and Prussian pagan peoples. Isn't it interesting that um, this, the religious order was actually combined with military purposes and now they're being sent out to battle against people? The order went into decline during Reformation uh, because there was such a problem conquering people by force and demanding them to believe in certain things uh, would not work, right? It was completely d dissolved by Napoleon in the early 19th century. But it was revived by the Austrian Emperor in 1834 and it survived today in Germany and Austria as a service organization. And uh, Benedictine monastic spirituality, uh, it was, um, of course, started with the uh, Benedict of Nursia, 480 to 547 again, and he lived in Italy. The rule of St. Bernard uh, became a foundational test for monasticism in the West, and having emerged in the 6th century as the Roman civilization was collapsing. And, uh, uh, how is Benedict known? Uh, because a person called Gregory the Great, um, he, he praised Benedict for discretion and moderation. And so he's known through this person. And even if you do a great job, um, there could be like no records. Like if, if there's nobody who leaves records and you, um, you're not known uh, to other generations, right? So then, uh, prologue through um, rule of Saint Benedict, rule of Saint Benedict, uh, 
page 7, uh, a foundational primer, 8 to 20, liturgical prayer, 20 to 67. Oh, these are rules, rule, rule numbers, right? Teachings for the common life, 68 to 72, uh, theology of monastic life, with an emphasis of love, prayer, and community. And um, 73 um, is a biblical, bibliography. So the core values, what are the core values of uh, Benedictian spirituality? Is once again, moderation, right? Balance is less about achieving perfect equilibrium than, it's a, than it is a pendulum. So go back and forth. Like a, I, I understand that human beings are not perfect when we cannot uh, perfectly point or stay in the perfect point. But if you like constantly check yourself and try to come back to the balance, how are we being invited to swing back toward Christ-centeredness? Christ is the center. Like if you have gone um, in any other direction, then try to come back. Right? What does it mean for us to learn contentment with living simply? Yeah. What are some of the lessons that we can get from the Benedictine spirituality? Right. Um, simple life. That kind of movement toward moderation is especially important as we live. The open and complex questions. Uh, so that was moderation. And then uh, another aspect is uh, dignity of work. So um, live a diligent lifestyle, right? right? We each desire to make a meaningful contribution to our world. So that's the purpose. Like rather than just, okay, work itself is meaningful. Work itself can be meaningful, yes. But then like, what is the ultimate purpose? Contribute to the world. How have we been equipped by God to do so? It is a matter of self-respect and purpose, which we see clearly in the changing nature of the retirement. And what do I make or make possible with the precious energy of my life? So these are some of the questions that you, you can focus on in order to pursue um, uh, value of work, the dignity of work. Now, um, listening was another important aspect. So if you go into a, a monastery, monastery, you probably see people talk less, much, much less. Okay? The discipline of slowing down to pay attention renews our orientation toward receiving the presence of Christ. What calls us to attention, what helps us to practice setting down our agendas um, in order to be more fully present. So, wow, this is an important principle that we uh, today in today's world that we need uh, slow down and be fully present so they diligently practice this uh, listening um, and then common good was another aspect the wisdom of native americans has often been quoted as a way of thinking about the long-term implications of our present actions what's the impact of our decisions of the seventh on the seventh generation and then um, stewardship, we're moved to profound respect for the ways the Creator puts resources at our disposal to further the kingdom of God. How can we, um, when we say kingdom, we're not talking about certain religious agendas, no. Because this universe is God's and His, His will is to, uh, to bless everyone, to, uh, to love everyone to teach everyone to love each other. Um, how can we actually be that transforming agent because this world has been darkened by the forces of evil? Um, how can we then do more of loving? How can we change the atmosphere by being the, being the change agent of God's kingdom is the perspective. So, um, That's stewardship and justice. Uh, people are tired and worn out from striving against unhealthy systems. Unfortunately, Jesus never indicated discipleship would be easy. No, it's not going to be easy. But how are you being called to participate in God's work of reconciliation, healing, and shaping structures that support values like this? So justice, love cannot be complete without justice. And justice has to start from the point of love. Reflection. So, uh, which value speaks to your heart most strongly, and why? And are you feeling called to commit the values to practice in your day days ahead? Um, 
So these are some of the questions that we can actually also utilize in order to maximize the uh, effect of our time with God. And um, also praying the Psalms uh, can be very helpful. So 13 out of 72 chapters in the rule of St. Benedict are devoted to instruction about liturgical prayer. So Benedict uh, goes to great lengths to establish a rhythm of life and community, which is punctuated by prayer. And um, um, it's called the Liturgy of the Hours and saturated in scripture. So most central in, uh, is praying the songs, which reflects the long-standing appreciation for the way this form of scripture connects so deeply with the human experience. So pray the Psalms for our own personal formation and in intercession for the world. So um, when we read the Psalms, it's in a poetic form and we read it. And uh, the purpose is for our own um, connection with God, but also in order to pray for the world. Uh, I see in this Psalm the human fallenness, our own sinfulness, oh that we can hurt other people. Oh, that we're uh, hurt by others. Uh, there's such evil, and I need to really. Uh, and there are people who are suffering under poverty. There are people who are, uh, you know, who are without help. Oh, I need to intercede uh, for the world. I will show you um, some of the songs. I mean, I think it's going to be really helpful in terms of uh, you understanding how we can uh, engage. So I'll show you, I'm trying to connect with the, um, internet so that I can show you the songs. Um, song, hmm, song 50, let's see, or song 3. Take a look at Psalm 2. Um, it says, Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with the rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise, be warned, you rulers of all the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son, or he will be angry, and your way will lead to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are, are all who take refuge in him. Why did the nations conspire and people plot in vain? So then um, when they're, when they're uh, conspiring with the Zidni, they are gathering their heads, to, gathering together to uh, come up with an evil plan to destroy other nations, other people. And they people, uh, and, and those people plot in vain. They plot against other people's destruction. And um, they think, they laugh at God. Um, if God exists, you know, well, why don't you come and stop? Like, nobody can stop us. Like, usually it, it's accompanied by pride. Once again, you know, the um, world powers tend to be very proud. And um, they can set their own rules, like, um, like a just war theory. I mean, we, we want to be careful. 
uh, about that. And, um, you know, although they have their own agendas, you know, it's ultimately for the country's good, their own good, but then they kind of uh, propagate that, you know, for example, I'll give you an example. Um, there was a period of time, 40 years of um, Japanese occupation in Korea. And uh, you probably understand this uh, well as well. And, uh, and, and I have Japanese friends, like I don't have, hold anything against them, but this was true. Um, they took over, they always uh, wanted the peninsula because it's a strategic location militaristically, uh, economically in every direction. That was the step stone to reach out to other countries um, of the continent. To, that was the gateway to the continent of Asia and therefore they always wanted that land and so they um, made it for throughout centuries, um, perhaps a millennium, in order to take over and they finally took over. And um, at that time, uh, there was a lot of evil doing, um, oppression, and uh, abuses going on. So, for example, they took away. Um, I have to take a look at the records, but uh, probably 90, 95% of all the crops. So you make effort, like today, we're utilizing a lot of the machines even drone, uh, drones in order to do farming, it has become much easier um, and you can do mass production. But in the past, everything but was by your hands and it, it took a lot of effort. And um, they were taken away by force, almost all of the farming uh, harvest, the, the harvest, um, and uh, all the livestock. And they took away men and women by force, they made them into slaves, uh, women especially for sex slaves, meaning um, Korea maintained um, this. One of the high values was uh, chastity, purity. Um, so people would commit suicide in order to keep their purity. They would fight with their um, life in order to keep that. And uh, these women, young women and girls, teenage girls, were taken by force and they were thrown in to uh, the military camps, uh, the tents, right? And uh, these soldiers would rape them uh, again and again until some, some people died, many women died by being uh, abused. Uh, and then their bo dead bodies were just thrown out. Uh, they were taken uh, as human experiment subjects. So they were taken and into uh, a concentration camp and uh, they would do human experiments like uh, gas chambers or uh, you know, uh, just cut them in, in different parts and uh, cut open a pregnant woman to take out a baby and to store them in a whatever the uh, like a uh, like in a glass container, all the fetuses, you know, in, in, in different months, just uh, let the woman die. Right? Um, I I can't describe like all the things they they uh, did what they did uh, what the Germans did to the Jew, uh, Jewish people. And uh, it probably even worse than that. And um, so then, uh, why are they doing that? By whose force are they doing this? Um, I, I don't think it's God who is behind. Um, it has to be the spirit of darkness. Um, they are just consumed by uh, wanting blood and just wanting evil uh, spreading rapidly and so then um, when the nations uh, conspire plotting, uh, plot that's mostly 
that's absolutely driven by the spirit of evil. But what he's saying is they plot in vain. Yes, for 40 years they suffered. But that's not going to be forever. When this country started to believe in uh, Jesus Christ, the situation changed. Many Christians died uh, fighting for the freedom of uh, the Korean Peninsula. And uh, vast majority of them were Christians. Those people who actually, the freedom fighters, were Christians. The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band, band together against the Lord and against his anointed. And this is talking about, of course, Christ. Nations conspire against Christ. Isn't that incredible? Um, but doing evil to um, kill the believers, God's precious children, that is going against God, right? Going against the anointed. There, there is a relationship. Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs it at them. Probably in that, if, if we were living in that reality, it was probably hard to imagine what this really meant. It took the eyes of the faith in order to see, finally, the emancipation from Japan's colonial rule. Those people who died laid, their, uh, laid down their lives in order to fight for the freedom. They died in anticipation that freedom was coming to Korea by God's power, right? So it takes the, the spiritual eyes to be able to see the future. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain, I will proclaim the Lord's decree. So another thing is, of course, people living in oppression can pray this prayer through the song, but also if we see anybody, any nation suffering under this kind of condition, as we read this, we can intercede for them, we can pray for them. So that's part of uh, Benedictian practice. Um, I will proclaim the Lord's decree. And uh, he said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise, be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son, or he will be angry, and your way will lead to your destruction, for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So this could be a song that you can pray for yourself, but also um, utilize in order to intercede for others. Um, we have finished the uh, the different traditions, monastery uh, monastery traditions, but we can continue on next week, um, next session. And uh, it's interesting to go back and visit uh, what has been done in the past because there's so much that we can actually take and learn from them. Also, learn the lessons so, so that we don't repeat the same mistakes. Um, so having said that, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for um, the, the lessons that you're giving us, Lord God, um, by studying the traditions. Father, help us learn um, great lessons from their uh, positive and negative aspects so that we can learn from their success and also mistakes. Lord, help us build our own uh, spiritual tradition upon this foundation. And Father, God, help us meet you closely through uh, Lexio Divina, Visio Divina, or whatever way that we utilize. And help us really uh, learn to prioritize our lives and live according to your will. So that in the end.